Hi everyone, welcome to this video on melting temperatures as it relates to nucleotide composition of DNA. So this is one of the common questions that comes up on DNA biotechnology. They ask which has the highest or lowest melting temperature and we'll give you a whole bunch of strands of DNA. So today we're going to talk a little bit about why different DNA strands have different melting temperatures and how you can predict the trend of melting temperatures given a set of DNA strands on test day. So let's get started. Okay, so before we dive into a MCAT style problem, I wanna review really quickly why melting temperature matters for nucleotide composition and what exactly is going on when we melt DNA. So in order to do that, the first thing we need to talk about are the two types of bonds in DNA. One is the phosphodiester bond. So on our little diagram down here, you can see different nucleotides. We have three nucleotides here and they are bound via phospho. You can see this phosphate group here and diester, the ester group of our ribose sugar, is covalently bound, right? And this is what makes up the backbone of our single strand of DNA, right? So this is kind of the outside edge of our DNA strand in our ladder. And if you remember from covalent bonds, right, they're super strong. Covalent bonds usually need enzymes to break them. In other words, if you just add heat to a DNA sequence, right, a single strand of DNA, nothing's gonna happen because these covalent bonds are very strong and they're not gonna be affected by just adding heat, right? We really need to do an enzymatic reaction to break up this strand into its component nucleotides. So why does melting temperature matter? It matters because of the hydrogen bonds that are found in the double-stranded DNA, right? When they kind of connect together to the two single strands. So here are the types of hydrogen bonds that you'll see in our base pairing of our two strands of DNA, right? They're facing each other and they have these hydrogen bonds. And they're usually denoted by dotted lines, as you see here, and they will do that on the MCAT as well. And so hydrogen bonds are not really bonds. Remember, it's a misnomer, if you remember from our gen chem. It's really an intermolecular force, intermolecular force, which means that there's an interaction between hydrogens and more electronegative atoms, such as nitrogen and oxygen, as you see here, where they're attracted to each other. They pull kind of close together and they hold that kind of general format most of the time. The exception is when we add heat, when we increase temperature, that will disrupt these bonds, right? And that's pretty much all you need to know about it for the MCAT. There's a whole bunch of thermodynamic components that go into why that's true. And if you're interested, check out all the thermodynamics extra videos. But for this video, we're really just focusing on the fact that heat increased temperature disrupts these hydrogen bonds. And interestingly, we have a different number of hydrogen bonds depending on the base pairing. So you probably remember this from your basic genetics classes, right? Basic biology classes, maybe AP bio in high school. We have two hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine right here, one and two. And we have three hydrogen bonds between guanine and cytosine. By the way, guys, on the MCAT, you do need to know these structures. You need to be able to tell the differences between the five nucleotides, including uracil. So make sure that you're able to identify all these on test day. So if you can see here, we have these three hydrogen bonds and between cytosine and guanine and two on adenine and thymine. So just based on that, which of the two has a stronger connection, right? Guanine and cytosine, right? The more bonds, even if it's intermolecular forces and not actually bonds, the more forces, the stronger the interaction is going to be, which means it's going to be, relatively speaking, more stable. So that just gets me to the rule that you need to know for the MCAT, which is that CG, cytosine guanine interactions, are stronger than AT interactions, which means if you have more CG content, this is usually how they phrase it, more CG content, you're going to have a higher melting 
temperature, right? And the reason why is it's going to be more stable for longer, right? If we have higher AT content relative to GC, we're going to have a relative lower melting temperature, right? So that's the, that's the rule, right? That's what you take into test day, but I did want to take a second in this video and explain why this was true so that you weren't just relying on this rule without understanding the concepts behind it. And again, just to drive this point home, these are not the phosphodiester bonds, right? Our single-stranded DNA is still going to be a long strand, right? Melting is not going to separate the strand from each other, that single strand. We're just breaking the two strands, right? That kind of connection of the double-stranded DNA, we're just separating them into single-stranded DNA. If you wanted to break the single strands down, you would need to put in enzymes into the process, right? PCR is a good example of how we do that. Okay, let's go ahead and do an MCAT style problem. Okay, so this is a classic MCAT style problem that you would see. These strands might not be in the answer choices, right? They might be in the passage, and then they ask you which of the strands in the experiment would have the highest melting temperature. So there's a couple different ways that they could show this, but the general concept is gonna stay the same. So take a second, based on what we just talked about, which of the following strands, one, two, three, or four, has the highest melting temperature when paired with its complementary strand, right? That's a key point. So simple way to do this, right? Just count your GCs, right? Here is G, that's only one. This is GC, that's two. This is GC, GC, that's four. And this is three. So we are looking for, as a reminder, the highest melting temperature, right? All right, so just based on that, when we pair these strands with their complementary strand, right, we're gonna have four GC pairs, which is the highest one, and that's gonna give us our highest melting temperature. All right, let's try a little bit of a different one. Let's try the opposite. Which strand, when paired with its complementation, has the lowest melting temperature? Try that one. All right, same as before, right? Okay, so you could do this one of two ways, right? You could look at the AT content, but I would say GCs are gonna be easier to look for, and we've already done that in our previous question, right? So we're just looking for the opposite trend here, one G instead of two, three, or four, right? The least GC content, the most AT content relative, which would be number one. So again, this is pretty straightforward, but I want to really drive home the point that this melting temperature is only ever referring to hydrogen bonds. They will ask you some tricky questions, maybe about resolving things into individual nucleotides. You need enzymes for covalent bonds, but hydrogen bonds can be disrupted by temperature. That is the rule. I hope you enjoyed and learned from this video. Check out the rest of the videos in this series for more practice on how biotechnology is tested on the MCAT. And for more content review on 1B topics, check out the link in the description below. I'll see you all next time.